So um, we are still in our Cornerstone series. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest. I really thought we would be done by now, and we're halfway through. So um, I'm just learning how long it takes for me to get through some of this stuff, which is good. Uh, So we um, are on Know Your Culture, and you might be thinking, oh, you skipped Know Your People. Yes, we did. We're coming back to it. Don't worry. We haven't left it behind. We will still be talking about that. But right now, we are focusing on our cornerstones. And the cornerstones are the values here at Life Church. We have four of them. They define everything we do and who we are. And so one of the cornerstones we, um, we started with was know your God. Then we went to know yourself. And now we're doing know your culture. We'll do know your people next. And so Nathan kicked this off for me this last week, right? And he kind of talked about uh, Daniel and kind of what God had called Daniel to do, being faithful where God had placed him, even when his even when the culture was coming against him, right? He also, he also did a really good job of also hitting up some pieces of identity. And if you didn't watch it last week, you can go to our YouTube channel and see it. But he also did a really good job hitting up some identity pieces, right? Because in order for you, because our, our tagline for Know Your Culture, right, is we value, I'm gonna make sure I say it right here, we value all people, right, and influence our world, right? We value all people and influence our world. Do you know that it is not possible for you to value all people if you don't know your identity? And here's the thing. It's because if you do not know who you are, you'll be more focused, more focused, more focused. I cannot talk this morning. You'll be more focused on finding out who am I than you will be on the people that God has placed around you and what he wants to do with them. So, So the truth is that in order to value people, it first starts with me. It first starts with us. And so I loved how Nathan was hitting up some of those identity pieces again last week, but also focusing on doing things God has called you to do regardless of what people may think, right? And that's a really hard thing to do in culture because our culture, our world, and when we're saying culture, we're not saying like you're a cultured person, you know, like my wife was watching uh, not Downton Abbey. I talked about it, right? And so she was, of course, oh, Sense and Sensibility. You know, she was watching this thing in there. They, one of those old movies, you know, about, uh, you know, long time ago in Britain, and they're very cultured people. You know, they're very posh. That's not what we're saying when we're saying cultured. We're saying that culture is really what makes up our world and what makes up our society, right? It's the things we listen to, the things we believe, how we talk. It's the languages that's used. And culture is a very diverse thing. But here's the thing, too, is there's a lot of pressure in culture for how you should respond. Some of those things are good, right? We have laws, we have rules, we have things that help keep people faithful, keep people honest. But the difficulty thing is, is that sometimes as Christians, what God calls us to do is actually kind of counter to what the culture says we should be doing. And that's even true with how God calls us to treat people. Because the world says that in order for you to value someone, they need to value you first, right? What culture tells us is that you value people based off of what they can give you, based off of their position in your life, if they're your boss or, you know, there's someone who's in a higher level of authority than you. That value is given because it is something that you are given as well. And, and then we have Jesus show up on the scene, and she just goes, no, 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 you value all people no matter how they treat you which is a very difficult thing to do if I don't first know my identity and who I am. So we've been focusing on identity. Who does God call us to be? Who are we? Because if I am, if I am firm, if I have a foundation on this is who God says I am, then even if I'm not given value by other people, it doesn't diminish who I am because I'm already firm in my identity. I can still value them in spite of how they're acting. Right? right? Easier said than done. Come on, way easier said than done. But this is what Jesus tells us to do in Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 43, for 40, blah, 43 through 48. Sorry, I just cannot talk this morning. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Funny thing, right? You, you've heard it said you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is still a very pre- prevalent thought with a lot of people. This is actually how a lot of people still live. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Ouch, right? You can be thinking, well, my reward is is that then I'm around people who at least like me all the time. 
right? You could say my reward is that, well, it's easier, Jesus, it's less hard. But no, no, here's the thing. He even goes farther. Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same. You know, Jesus comes on the scene and he gives us this radical idea that value for people is not based upon how they act or treat you. It's actually based on who you are. So when I am out in the world, when I am out in culture, when I am at my job and someone is being cruel to me, someone is being rude to me, someone is not being nice, their attitude is not powerful enough to change my identity and who I am. Because I know who God calls me to be, and I know that he tells me to love all people, that I need to value all people. Even when you come in and you're just in a crummy place, I know I can still value you. Because you are not more powerful than the word of God over my life. You are not more powerful than the identity that God has spoken over me. You are not more powerful than the promises he has for me. But here's the thing. A lot of us live in a reactionary stance, right? Where the things that people do and the things that people say have more power than the word of God over our lives. And that's because, you know, something we can say, well, sometimes we tend to live in this little Christian bubble right here. Like on Sundays, it's easy, we're all pretty much in agreement here. We're all having a good time. We're all, yay, gee, you know, we're all excited about it. And then tomorrow morning, though, you got to get up on Monday and you got to go into the office and you know who is going to be there. Yeah. Come on, right? You know that, oh, tomorrow I'm going to have to get up and deal with so, like, or next week is Father's Day. My whole family's going to get together. I don't have any issues, but my sister's going to be there and Lord knows, right? You know, the Lord knows, you know, like, we, we have this attitude sometimes, right, that people have more authority in our lives than the word of God. And that's why our identity is so important, because for us to truly influence culture, we need to learn how to value people. Value. You will have no influence without value. You'll, you'll have none. You will struggle. And I'm going to tell you what. There's some of you right now, it's not that the influence is not available where you are at right? It's that you haven't learned how to value the people where God has placed you. And I'm not saying that to make you "Eh," you know, feel bad about it, but I want you to consider it right now. Do I actually value, do I truly love the people that God has placed in my life? Because I'm going to tell you what, you are working where you are at, you are in the family you are in, you are where you are because you have something to offer those people. Because the presence and the spirit of God, according to the Bible, dwells within you. And because the presence and the spirit of God is inside of you, wherever you go, the kingdom of God goes as well. Right? And so in order for you to influence, in order for you to bring culture changes where God has placed you, you first need to learn that everyone around me is valuable. And they first don't get to change my value. I actually get to influence their value. Right? It's even, I should, I should look at my notes here. I feel like I might be going a little off. <sighs> We're good. Okay, good. You know, it's also one of the hardest things to do, I think, when someone is in your face. Right? Like when they're coming at you or, the, or you feel like they're attacking you. That's one of the hardest moments because, like I said, we tend to be very reactionary people. Right? When someone is in my face, my immediate thought is not, oh, you're valuable. You're wonderful. Like, thank you for screaming and spitting on me. You know, my, you know your, your immediate thought is like, you don't throw down. Punch him. Yeah, you're like, I mean, I've never done that, but I'm like, you know, my words are weapons. You know, I'm like, come on. Let's, you know, you, you, we, we can tend to react, right? It's a very difficult place to be in. So I, I don't want to deny the difficulty and the struggle of it, right? But I'm going to tell you something. You learn and you know when you're truly growing and valuing and loving people, when you're in that situation and your first thought isn't fight, your first thought is, wow, I know the Lord right now wants to do something in this moment. I know that you are hurting right now, which is why, and I'm not going to say that to him, right? Do not say that to the person. That's not love and that's not wisdom. But, you know, you know, okay, wow, this is coming out of a place of hurt. So, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? How do you want to move? It's difficult and it's hard. But really what it is, too, is it's us moving from having a victim mentality into being a powerful person in a situation, right? And... 
I'm not going to preach on this a lot. I will later. I, I have a whole message I want to do on being powerful people in, in culture because I feel like it's important. But I want to tell you right now that, that that's the thing is a lot of us tend to victimize, right, the things that happen to us in our, and where God has placed us. And I'm not saying, I want you to hear me right now. I am not saying that if you have been abused, if you have been hurt, right, that you are not a victim. I'm not saying there is not hurt and that there was not pain, all right? I'm not saying that whatsoever. What I'm saying is that oftentimes in the places where God places us, people aren't always fans of us. People come against us. You might get persecuted. And in those moments, you have a choice that either I can step into victimhood and be like, woe is me, or actually take my eyes off myself, put my eyes on the Father, and as a powerful person go, Lord, what do you want to do with the people around me? How can I pray for them? How can I move and see you touch them? Right? There are, and like I said, I want you to hear me so clearly here, right? There are people who have been, who have been powerless situations and someone took advantage of them. I am not talking about that, right? But I'm talking about in our culture, it seems like we've gotten to the point where it's more easy to be the victim and blame everyone else than it is easy to realize God says I'm powerful. God says I'm a child. God says I'm a son. God says I'm a daughter right? And, and it is hard, all right? It is not easy. But me learning how to value people actually increases my level of influence with them. And in doing so, I can move from victimhood to powerfulness, okay? Hopefully you're fine. And if you have an issue with what I just said or you did not understand, come and talk to me, okay? I ain't afraid. You can come talk to me. Um, I don't have this verse, but I'm going to read it here because the Lord was putting it on my heart, uh, Mark 10, 46 through 52, says, you can turn in your Bibles there, like I said, I'm not going to have it on the screen for you, I apologize, I'm a little behind on this one, but Mark 10, 46 through 52, there's a story, and it says, then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, to, and said call him here. So they called the blind man saying to him, take courage and stand up. He's calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and began following him on the road. I'm, I'm talking about the story because we're talking about valuing people, right? And when I read this story, especially this week when I was reading this story, it was hitting my heart how I don't think anyone would have turned to help him if Jesus hadn't done it first. Everyone ignored him. Everyone put him aside. Everyone saw what he, was, what he looked like, the situation he was in, and they said, be quiet, do not talk. It wasn't until Jesus said, bring him here, that all of a sudden everyone's attitude towards him changed. Are there people in your life who are crying out, who are crying for the Lord, and you're going, no, 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 I'm just trying to focus on Jesus. Like, shh, be quiet. I'm trying to hear what God is saying. You're being really loud. I'm going to tell you what. There are so many people in the world who are hungry for him, who are crying out for him, who are desperate for him. And what I see in this story is I see Jesus going, this is what value is. It's stopping when it's not always comfortable. It's stopping for someone who is outside of my norm, and it's having compassion upon them. When you're on the road, when you're driving, when you're in the store, do you have value for people, or are you more focused on what you're trying to get done? Sometimes both. That's fair. Sometimes both, right? Sometimes both. You know, he cries out, and Jesus Jesus decided to actually challenge the social norms of what it meant to value people. He did it all the time throughout the Bible. Because people had an idea that for you to be valued, you had to be important. You had to have so much knowledge and education. You had to be um, someone who was in high levels of authority. And Jesus actually flips it on the head and goes, no, no, no. Everyone has valuable. 
It doesn't matter what situation you're in, what your social class is, what the color of your skin is. Whoever you are, you are valuable to Jesus, right, to him. And so when we talk about stepping out of this building, when we talk about going out into culture, right, my, how I value people needs to line up with how Jesus did it. And sometimes we can get so distracted, sometimes we can get so lost in the things we're trying to accomplish and do that we forget that people are the most important thing to him, that he loves them, that he's so passionate about them, you know? And that's the other thing about value. Value, (laughs) value for people is something that's built. I I remember when I first got my job at Pizza Hut down in Redding, California. Yay, Pizza Hut, woohoo. I I was interviewing with the manager, and she was like, oh, you're one of those Bethel kids. Because Bethel had a reputation, right? Not always a good one, you know? Um, And so I was like, yes, it is I, an 18-year-old Bethel kid, you know, like fresh out of the house and ready to go do some good. And um, she was like, okay, I'll hire you, but I want you to know. I've had a lot of issues, you know, with kids from Bethel and all these things. She gave me this whole list of reasons why. And so I remember I stepped into an environment that did not automatically value me and wasn't necessarily excited I was even there. You know, it was more like, hey, we're desperate for workers. You're willing to work part-time and have no skills. Wonderful. Come in. You know, like that's, that, that's where I was at at that, at that point in my life. And so I stepped into it. And I remember that one of the first things we, we learned at Bethel was about a culture of honor right? And about really what, it, what does it mean to honor people, to value people? And they really drilled it into us, you know, that, that we honor not because other people honor us, but because we are honorable, right? And so in that place, I was like, okay, I'm going to honor everyone who's here. I'm going to show them, you know, what it, what it means, and I'm going to value them. And so I remember showing value, showing value, but it was not something that was like, flick a switch. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, Oh, it's great. You know, no, no, not at all, right? It took months of being faithful where God had placed me, of being kind, of being, of showing how much I appreciated them, of showing my value for them before influence was released. But here's the thing, right? Is that as I was faithful where God had placed me, as I was kind, as I was loving, as I realized the value that these people had around me, they offered me the job to promote, you know, to step up into a management position. So I said, okay, great. And so all of a sudden, I do have influence. But, but here's the thing, right? I have influence in a job. I don't necessarily have influence over the entire culture, right? Or I don't necessarily have influence over each and every person. But what I do have is the Holy Spirit living inside of me. So when situations would come up, I could actually get to deal with them when someone else couldn't. We had this person, you know, who called on the phone one day, and they were angry because they got pineapple on their pizza. I would be there too, right? Pineapple is not of the Lord. I don't even know what happened. I don't know who put it on pizza. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I know. My wife doesn't agree with me. I just want you all to know, pepperoni and olive is what the Lord decreed, what he declared. So I'm just moving on from that. That's what he said. So I had this lady who called because she got pineapple on her pizza. She didn't want pineapple on her pizza. You know, and I automatically have compassion for her because I'm like, I understand. But she was, she was calling and she was cussing out one of uh, my employees right? She was, you know, berating them and being very rude. And so I ended up getting the phone, dealing with her, right? And then I have this employee all of a sudden who is crushed and who didn't honestly handle it correctly. What an amazing opportunity in that moment to share value, right? Because value is, hey, that was a really tough call. And I'm so grateful that you did the best you could. And I'm so grateful that you were, you were still kind, you were still compassionate, and that you, you kept your cool even when it was difficult. That was an amazing thing to see. And then we can talk about, okay, what are some other things we can do? But I'm going to tell you what. Moments like that of showing people that they matter, that they're important. And they're not just important because I'm trying to get something out of them. But I'm truly partnering with the love of Christ for them. Will release influence in your life. Because all of a sudden, she was open to more things. So what are you learning at Bethel? Oh, let me blow your mind for a second, right? (laughs) All those fun things, right? Value does not happen overnight. It is something that is built. It is something that grows. It is something that increases. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says this, if you want to throw it up on the screen for me. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. 
Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What a verse, right? And in this verse, Paul is writing to the Philippians church because they were having discord and they were having issues amongst themselves within the church. How many of you know we can struggle to value those who are sitting all around us in the church? How many of you ever had a disagreement in the church with somebody else, right? Well, I'm glad half of you haven't. You're way better than the rest of us. Awesome. You know. Now, let's be real, right? There is tension. There is disagreement. It can be hard sometimes to value our very brothers and sisters in Christ. And so Paul is writing to them, you know, saying, hey, like, live at the level of love you're called to. But what's more, we know that we're not called just to love those who are in this room. We're called to actually take it out of this church and into the world. And so that means we have to actually raise it up a little bit. So Paul says, do nothing nothing out of selfish ambition. Not a single thing, not a single thought, not a single word, not a single action. Woo! I'm not there yet. (laughs) Right? Do nothing out of selfish ambition. It's all-encompassing. Right? It's the idea of... (laughs) I, I think about, when I read this, do nothing out of selfish ambition. I think about us as kids, right? When there's that last piece of pie... And mom goes, you can split it amongst yourselves. And every tape measure, every measuring stick, right, down to the cent- dad's laser measure thing, you know, is coming out. And we're like, and you're cutting that piece of pie. And you're like, your slice is bigger. It looks bigger. No, it looks bigger. Like, you owe me at least a quarter of an apple to even out this apple pie. You know, like, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's that idea, right, that the selfish ambition is this idea that I need to get more or I'm willing for other people to lose in order for me to increase, for me to gain, right? And, and the thing about selfish ambition, I don't think it's something most of us intrinsically think about or believe or actually step into situations trying to be selfishly ambitious. Instead, we get into situations and corners where people are being selfish and we feel like we need to respond in the same way. Instead of realizing that even if they are not healthy, even if they are not living as they should be, it doesn't have to change how I am called to live. It doesn't change how I value them. In fact, this word selfish ambition, right, is a desire to put oneself forward. And it's the same word we talked about when we were talking about wisdom a few months ago. It's the same word that's in James 3.16, all right? And it is a partisan and a divisive word divisiveness. So when you actually step into selfish ambition, thinking of yourself above someone else, and sometimes it's little things, right? Like, ooh, well, if I just cut in front of this person, you know, I can get through the light before them. You might be like, well, that's, that's a silly little thing. Yeah, but little things build over time, you know? Oh, if I, you know, if I, if I oh, if I don't hurry up and get to the back, I'm not going to get that last cookie before anybody else. Silly. It can be bigger at your work. Right? Well, if my boss knows what so-and-so did, I'll be more likely to get the promotion over them. It could be, well, truthfully, it was my fault that this happened with my car, but if I just twist the truth through my insurance, I'll still be able to get out of it. It's, <laughs> ooh, now we feel it uncomfortable, right? Because we're all like, oh, it's not my issue. And then, you know, oh, no, the pastor's laying it out for me. Uh, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it can be, um, wow, you know, I know that my husband or wife really wants to go to this family event. Maybe if I just feel sick enough, I won't have to go, right? It's this idea Right? About being against or putting yourself before someone else. And it's not how we're called to live. And the thing is, is that Paul's not saying ambition is bad. Right? Because if you notice it, he just says selfish ambition. Ambition in itself, sense, is not an evil thing. You can be driven. You can want to excel. You can want to be excellent where God has placed you. That is not a bad thing. Right, But when your desire for excellence and growth comes at the expense of someone else, then you've stepped into sin. Right, And so he is saying don't be, the selfish ambition, right, is also, this word also um, would describe in this time period a, um, a mercenary. 
It's someone who does something for money or for hire. So it's somebody who gets paid to do something or goes out to do something, and they're more interested in what they're getting from what they're doing and then who it hurts in the process, right? It's a really intense word. And the thing is, like I said, most of us, I don't think, walk out there trying to be just selfish. No, but if we're not careful, if we're not watching our hearts, if we are not valuing people, it's an easy thing to fall into. It's an easy thing to step into without even realizing it. And what it does is it actually releases divisiveness in your life. Because it's this thing that fractures, this idea of like you know, breaking the plate. It's this thing that divides. And if we are not careful, sometimes, right, the divisiveness in your life is not because of just the people around you. Sometimes it's because you've partnered with a spirit other than the Holy Spirit. Okay? So sometimes we can be in places and we can be like, this place is broken, it's awful, I do not like this office. But you've actually joined in with how the office runs and operates. You've actually partnered with the spirit that's there. Instead of going, wherever I go, the Holy Spirit comes with me. So when I walk into my office, it does not get to affect me, I get to affect it. Not an overnight thing. It's something that's built. You have to be faithful with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure I'm communicating it here. Ambition is not bad, like I said. Um, but when selfness, selfishness gets attached to it, that's when we actually are stepping into sin. So here's the thing too, right? It's what current Western culture thrives on is the sacrifice of the many for the few to gain. You know, and we see it all the time. And probably some of you have felt it before, where someone has sacrificed you or their relationship with you, or they've sacrificed um, your reputation in order to build themselves up. A lot of us have dealt with it. A lot of us have felt, have felt it before, right? But in Galatians 5.14, right, it tells us, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Ephesians 4.32 tells us, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Here's the thing is everything we are called to be as Christians is counter to how we are treated and counter to the culture. And that puts us often in a hard spot where when you are out this week at your job, you get the choice of how you're going to live and what spirit you're going to partner with. I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit wants to partner with you. He wants to do something. He wants to move. He wants to see people touched, right? But you have to make the choice in this. What's more, it tells us then that in, uh, you know, go back to the Philippians for me. Here, Alicia. Uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Vain conceit, uh, the word translates into the idea of like an empty glory. So it's someone who is seeking to puff themselves up, build themselves up, get glory for themselves, but it's actually empty. It's like an empty vessel. It looks great on the outside. There's nothing within it is the idea there. And it goes, rather in humility, value others above yourself. And here's the thing about humility. I want to kind of talk about this little piece for a second, right? It's modesty. It's lowliness of mind. It's thinking humbly of oneself, right? Humility isn't putting yourself down, Right? Okay, I'm going to say it again because you got you to gotta understand this, right? Humility is not putting yourself down or degrading you, yourself, right? That's not true humility, right? That's not what humility is. Humility, right, it's false humility if you say, I'm horrible, I'm not as good as everyone else, I'm just, I'm not a great person. That's not it, right? Your identity as a child in Christ isn't diminished by humility, okay? So what am I, I'm saying that a lot of us think that to be humble, I have to put myself down, but I'm here to tell you that your identity in Christ, right, who God says you are is up here and your humility actually can match it because humility isn't me saying something bad about someone else, I mean about myself, it's actually about me lifting other people up because I'm not going to lord over who I am, I'm instead going to call them up to where God wants them to be, right? It's the, um, <laughs> it's building others up. Yeah, come on. You do 
And you will make mistakes. Here's the thing too, right? You will make mistakes. You will stumble and fall. But it's also not humility to glorify your mistakes over God's grace. And that's difficult. It's not humility to (laughs) tear yourself down so someone else can feel better about themselves. It's actually humility to call them higher. And this is what value does. When we really value people, when we value those God has placed in our life, when we understand that they are loved and important, what we do is in humility, we come up beside them and we go, let me show you what God says about you. Let me show you who you are called to be. In order for you to value others as God has called you to, it must first be done in humility. And you know, I'm going to close up with this story. I had, um, when I was 20 years old, I was a third year in Bethel, and um, I was young, I was... I was young, that's the best way to say it. I'm still young, I know. You're like, oh, you're still young. Thank you, yes, I'm aware. I was younger. There you go, high about that. I was younger. Um, and part about being an intern is that you had to mentor the small group leaders who were down there. And I've kind of told this story before, so it might sound familiar. But I had to mentor um, the small group leaders who were down there. And so I'm a 20-year-old, and the small group leaders I had under me was um, a, oh, what was it? He was, I think, a 25-year-old, a 32-year-old, a 30, probably close to close, 35, 32 year old, and a 70 year old. And it was my job to mentor them <laughs> at 20. And I went in willing and excited. Like, I'm like, I will pour into you. It will be great. God's so good. You know, I'm, I'm all excited about it. And so I have my meeting with the first 35 year old, and he basically to my face goes, You know, you're too young to have anything of value for me. So I don't even see any point in us meeting uh, after this. And I was like, (laughs) I was blown away. I was shocked. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like not, you know, not what I was expecting. Met with the other, you know, 30-year-old. And he didn't say the same thing. He was like, I'm willing to get together, but but you're 20. You know, like what what do you have, right? And I, I, it shocked me a little bit. It hurt me a lot, right? Because I, you know, Bethel is so big at teaching. There is no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. Right? We believe that all people are valuable. All people have something to give. So I remember I went to the meeting like about a week later with the 70-year-old, and I was dreading it because I am like, oh, you know, if a 30-year-old thinks I have nothing, you know, this guy's three times my age, he's going to look at me and laugh. That's what he's going to do. You know, he's going to be like, can you ever grow a beard? And I'm going to be like, no, it's impossible. Right? This baby face, don't grow no, no hair. Right? It's just it's going to be what's going to happen. So I go in. I sit down to a breakfast with him, and it's this older British guy uh, named David sit down with them, and we start talking, you know, and he's like, well, what do you want to get out of this? And this is what I would love to get out of it. And he goes, you know, I just want you to know that even though you're younger than me, I believe you have something to give me. And I believe I can learn from you. I I cannot tell you the level of influence he suddenly gained in my life when he showed value for me. I I was blown away. Because not only did he call me higher, And I actually wanted then to offer something to him. I wanted to pour into him, right? I all of a sudden, too, saw this mature man that I was like, I want to be at that level. And him just communicating value called me up. The influence it had in my life just increased all of a sudden. And the level of humility that he walked in to tell a 20-year-old he had never met I believe you have something to offer. I'm going to tell you what, that, that's one of those moments in my life that I believe shifted something. Because I saw real humility. Yeah. I saw someone being humble and communicating value. And honestly, after that, he could be really honest with me and I'd listen. Because I was like, you, you can be, tell me, you know, grow me, speak to me, you know, like... Who cares now about me giving you anything? Like, you know, pour into me. You know, like, I want to tell you, right? We're we're talking about influencing culture, but it always first starts with valuing people. You can want to be an an influencer. It's not the word I wanted to use. You can want to bring influence to culture and to people. You can want to change the work you're at, the workplace you're at. You can want to, you know, change the world. I want to make an impact 
in the business realm. I want to make an impact in the music realm. You, you can have all those desires. But until you learn to value people, you will never be able to truly influence where you're at. Until you understand that the Barnabas crying out on the side of the road is just as important, right, as where you're trying, it's more important actually than where you're trying to go, until you're willing to stop and value someone who doesn't necessarily deserve it, you will not truly have influence. And here's the thing, once again, like I said before, you can be a manager and someone who's in charge of where you're at, right? And there is a level of influence with that. I'm not talking about influencing just in the job sense. I'm talking about influencing hearts. Because when you influence hearts, you can point them to Jesus. And when they meet Jesus, everything changes. Can you stand with me?